In this video, I'm going to talk about Odor World, which is this com kind of component right here. You could make Odor Worlds by clicking on this world icon and going to Odor World. It makes a little two dimensional virtual world in which you have this simulated agent with some smell sensors and different objects which the agent can smell. You could have multiple agents in a world. You could uh, edit them. You could give them different sensors and different kinds of sensors here. Right? And you could add, give them effectors, different kinds of effectors. So in the past, I found it kind of difficult to explain what's going on in these odor worlds. Um, the basic idea is pretty simple, right? There are these 2D environments that allow you to simulate things like smell and simple motion. Um, but some of the details get a little tricky. And in writing the documentation for this and in explaining it, uh, in classes where I've taught this, um, there's a lot of details, and so I kind of want to go over it carefully in this video. We can create an odor world here, and it comes pre stocked with a few objects. Uh, there's two kinds of objects in an odor world there's agents like this mouse, and then there's static entities like these cheeses and flowers. And to add new um, agents, you go to add agent, and by default, it's the mouse. To add new objects, you add uh, entity, by default, it's this. Swiss cheese, and then you could double click on these and change their properties. You could change uh, basically the image associated with them. I think there's a candle and poison and stuff in here. Um, you could model reinforcement kinds of conditioning tasks that way. Um, and same with the agents. Uh, there's different um, people and animals that you could add. Uh, it's a lion, okay. And then uh, the two kinds of objects have different kinds of properties. So all objects have things like an x and y coordinate and a velocity, which is usually set to zero. Actually, if you want to get mo some real simple motion, you just add some velocity, and then now at every iteration, uh, one will be added to the x coordinate and one will be added to the y coordinate, and so you'll kind of get this oh quickly moving. Poison, which is not very realistic. Tone that down a little. Um, maybe make it more in the y direction. So you get a okay. Uh oh. And you could see the incredible graphics we've provided here. Um, so, so someday we're going to have to replace this with um, a more modern uh, graphics library. Um, but it gets the job done for simple simulations. Now, in addition to the basic properties, any object can be endowed with a smell property. It could sort of be a smell source, something that disperses smells in a kind of radius around it. Um, by default, all the static entities uh, have these uh, are smell sources. The agents, by default, are not. And so for an agent, you'd, you have to right click on it and say add smell source. And you just give it a number here, which I'll explain in a, in a moment. And now um, this is a smellable mouse here. Or we could just change it to a cow. It is now a smellable cow. And the way the smells work is that um, a smell source is associated with a vector of values, so a list of numbers, and a dispersion. And so the idea is, is that this object can be smelled in some radius of pixels around, around it. So. Um, and that dispersion value is captured by this here. So it's now smellable in a range of 70. So to illustrate some of this, I decided to uh, get rid of the uh, effector nodes here. And so all we have now is the cheese and the mouse. And if we run it now, we can see uh, roughly how smell works, right? So there's a right sensor here and a left sensor here. And it is uh, smelling things in a dispersion of 200 right now. And so if it's 200 pixels away, probably about like this, it's still going to smell something. And then at, you know this is probably about 200 pixels here. So that's, that's the range. It's got sort of a circle um, around it within which it could be smelled. And so I could then change that dispersion to make it something smaller like 50, less smelly cheese. This would be now no longer fancy French uh, aged cheese, but store-bought lousy cheese. <laughs> All right, so now you can only smell it when you get really close. Okay, so the radius of smell has changed. 
And you could also adjust the way the sort of gradient um, works, right? So it's sort of smelliest right when you're on top of it, and then it, it kind of uh, decays as you move farther away. And you could see at first it just smells a little in this right sensor here, and then as you get closer, it increases to this kind of maximal value of looks like about 0.6. Okay, and that is set. Let's make the dispersion bigger again, uh, maybe back to 200. And then it, this is right now. It's got a linear. Uh, it sort of just drops off linearly from its maximal smell of 0.7. It looks like, and I'll, I'll explain more about this vector in a second. So right, but just it's it's course it's responding to this very first row of this table here. Um, so it drops off linearly from a max of 0.7 to 0, but we could also have it fall off uh, in a, using a Gaussian or quadratic function or a step function even. And so the way the step function would work is it smells it maximally while it's in range and then it doesn't smell it at all when it's out of range. Um, and so that's the basic idea of smell. And of course, th this has to have smell sensors and those are set here. Okay, and there's three smell sensors right now, and you can see they correspond to these three locations on the mouse's body. And you could add more. I could add another smell sensor, and this determines the length and angle. It's sort of polar coordinates. Let's make it 100, and uh, the angle, which is, I think, in radians. I don't know. Let's put something in. Okay. Um, okay, and so now we see there's this weird other smell sensor out there. So now I want to talk about stimulus vectors. And I find this topic um, ultimately simple, but kind of tricky to explain. Um, so uh, here goes. And in the process, I'm going to cover a topic in cognitive science, this idea of distributed versus local representations. And I think that might help understand what's going on. So the way smell works is that uh, different objects, uh, for example, the Gouda versus the Swiss cheese, will have differential impacts on the receptors in your nose, in the nasal epithelium. Uh, and the idea is, is that uh, when you smell Gouda, you might have in one receptor, you'll have a strong response. And then in these other receptors, you'll have other levels of response. Um, and so maybe strong, medium, medium for Gouda versus uh, Swiss cheese, it'll be kind of medium and a little lower than medium and then strong, let's say. And you could think of this as a kind of waveform and different uh, smell objects, different objects will produce smells that produce different kinds of waveforms of activity across the receptors in your nose. Uh, and you can think of it as every object you encounter is associated with a different characteristic waveform. So the way we do this in SimBrain is we associate each object with what we call a stimulus vector, which is a list of numbers. And then th these are the indices of the numbers, right? So we've got a first uh, number, a second number, and a third number, right? So we've got these three numbers that correspond to these three levels. And same with a Swiss. So I'm going to go to the SimBrain simulation, and we've got the stimulus vectors of these objects can be seen by double clicking on them. So Gouda has a stimulus vector of 1.4.2, whereas Swiss has a stimulus vector of 0.4.21, which kind of corresponds to the, you know, these pictures, right? 0 0.4, 0 0.21 versus 1, and then two smaller values. And to model this in SimBrain now, we could then just uh, connect this sort of smell sensor, this bank of sensor neurons, directly to one of these sensors, and it will pick up this entire uh, stimulus vector, right? So you could see we get the strong response in the first component and then a smaller response in the others, like this, versus when it smells the Swiss cheese, we get these sort of medium to small responses in the first two receptors, and then a strong response in the third one. And this is realistic, OK? And this is called a distributed representation. So the objects are associated with a distribution of activations over a bunch of neurons. All right, So that's called a distributed representation. Um, now the confusing thing is, is that oftentimes, uh, th I mean, this is great. We could do a lot with this. But oftentimes, it's useful to use what's called a localist representation, which is just simpler in a lot of ways. And in a localist representation, we simplify it so that only one of these columns, only one of these receptors is active for a given object. So the idea here is we just sort of say that the Gouda cheese only activates the first receptor 
and the Swiss cheese only activates the third receptor. Um, and the way we do that is we still have these stimulus vectors, right? these lists of numbers, but we just put a 1 in this column and then zeros in these column, columns. Whereas here we put 0, 0, and then a 1 in this column. And you can see this here. Um, now I've set the stimulus vectors to be 1 and then all zeros. And then this one is 0, 0, and then 1 in the third row, okay, the third component. And now when we run it, we see we get a very different kind of representation, right? We get each uh, each object activates a different sensor, and this is called a localist representation. And this makes it a lot easier to understand what's going on for simple simulations. And in fact, we could even just label these now. So we've got our Gouda receptor, and now now it's kind of immediately apparent what's going on. Uh, but when you set these things up, you notice you've got this vector of values. We're calling a stimulus vector. And you have to do it kind of like this. You have to sort of say, all right, the first row is what I'm going to say is the one for Gouda. And then you set that up. And now once you do this, the advantage of it is, is you could use scalar coupling. So you could sort of make special, I could make, for example, I could say, I want this, you know, so let's say I get rid of this bank of nodes, and I say, I want this to be a Gouda receptor. Okay. Well, we know that Gouda only has activation in the first row of the stimulus vector. And so I don't know, you got to remember that number one here, right? This number one, the first row of the stimulus vector. And so we're going to have to right click here, receive scalar coupling from the three cheese simulation. And then this is, let's do the cent center one. Okay. So this, so this is the left sensor, first row of the stimulus vector. This is the second uh, sorry, this is a center sensor, so this one, and then the second row, and then this is the right sensor, this one. All right, so let's just do the, the center one, and then uh, first row. Sorry, we want the first row. And now it will respond to Gouda, but nothing else. Okay, and using this technique, we can now create different nodes that respond to, like, you know, Gouda on my left or Swiss cheese on my right. And in fact, I have this two object simulation that responds to cheese and poison on the right and cheese and poison on the left. And when you look in the coupling manager, you could see, all right, the first row of the stimulus vector is the one being used for, uh, I believe, cheese. And then the fourth uh, row of the stimulus vector is being used for the poison. And if we open this up, we'll see, uh, oh, I had it backwards. So the poison is using the first row, and then the cheese is using the fourth row. Okay, which you could see there. And now you can get interesting differential kinds of behaviors uh, where this is now pursuing cheese, but it's avoiding poison. It's, and when, when they're both there, it's kind of confused, you could see. Um, it's sort of tempting poison. Um, it's a poison apple. Don't eat it. Um, so that's how you do it, and it's not quite realistic. It would be more realistic to use these distributed kinds of representations. Um, but for simple simulations, this is a little easier to understand. But the hard part is, is just at first, I think this stimulus vector thing, this, this set of values here is a little confusing. So I hope that clears it up. OK, so now let's talk a little bit about effectors. We'll come back to sensors at the end briefly, because there's a few other kinds. Um, but let's move to the sort of main types of effector. So I'm going to get rid of these sensors. And uh, let's start sort of um, moving the mouse around uh, by creating a straight motion effector. Now, if you double click on the mouse, you'll see that there are, is a list of effectors here. One is for going straight, and there are a few for going left or right. Um, and you could add other kinds of effectors as well, as I mentioned earlier. So there's a few different choices here. And so let's now couple to the straight movement effector. And to do that, let's make a node that is clamped. So I'm going to set clamping to on. And in the next iteration of SimBrain, I'm going to make it easier to clamp nodes, because that's a fairly common operation. So at any rate, we now have this node that just takes uh, any given value and just stays at it. And to couple this to the uh, agent here, we right click on the node, uh, go to send scalar coupling to, and then odor world and agent one go straight. And now it will go straight 
uh, by a number of pixels proportional to this value. And so if we clear it, it doesn't move. If we put a negative value, it moves backwards. Okay, and so we get sort of simple movement. We could randomize. Every time we randomize, it'll move at a different speed, forward or backwards. Okay. Um, so that's straight motion. I often It's often helpful to label these so you know what's going on. All right, let's now make a sensor or an effector for turning. So I've added a node called turn right here. And I believe I made it clamped. Yes, it's clamped uh, for this demonstration. And to couple this to the agent, I will, let's try the um, coupling manager this time just to review. And so our producer is going to be uh, the network. And I believe it's this neuron four here. Uh, no, neuron three, OK. And uh, the consumer is going to be um, turn right. So we, uh, those are compatible attribute types. They're both scalars. We add the coupling. You see it uh, visible there. And now if we run this and add activation to this turn right, you could see it turns to the right. And if I put in negative values, it'll actually turn left. OK, and so we now have this. A simple a pair of effectors, we could randomize them and ooh, that is not good. All right. A, um, but we can make it go straight and then have it turn a little um, and just generally control the agent. Um, oh, a real quick side note um, there's a few general properties of the Odor world. One of them is whether the objects block movement, another is whether the world wraps around. So if you turn that off, yeah, it gets blocked on the side of the world. So you can set things up that way. And you could also have objects block movement. OK, so right now, objects don't block movement. Um, but if I set this to true, then it'll just kind of bump into the object. In addition to these simple motion effectors and smell sensors, there are a few other uh, kinds of effectors and sensors um, in the odor world. Um, one of them is a very simple speech and hearing setup. Um, let me try and demonstrate that. I have not practiced this, so hopefully it will go smoothly. So we could add a, a speech effector. So effector type speech um, to uh, our agent. So I'll have it be hello YouTube. And what this will do is it will receive a scalar coupling, um, probably from a node. And if that the activation on that coupling is above this number, the agent will produce that utterance. Just to save time, let's uh, make a coupling from this node to it. So send scalar coupling, order world one, say hello YouTube. We'll set it to zero. This also points out that you could have one to many couplings. So this is already coupled to straight motion, but now we've uh, coupled it also to this simple speech uh, effector. So it's just sitting there, and now if we make it move, it says hello YouTube. Okay, and that warning dialog was right. Boy, that's not a very good rendering. Um, let's see, let's edit it and just have it say hello. Maybe that'll do better. Okay, yes, that's a little nicer. Okay, and now it'll stop talking, and now it'll talk again. Okay, and you could also make um, objects which produce speech, which is then heard. And this is actually all in this um, Bischoff example. I use some of this. This is a, a model of where, at a certain age in development, um, the child uh, wants to be near its parent, um, but not too close, right? OK, let me give you one last example. Um, if you run this actor critic model, uh, it uses these tile sensors, and the idea here is that wherever um, the mouse is, you know, when the mouse passes over a tile, say that tile there, then um, it that tile is activated, and then that tile um, is coupled to the corresponding node in this bank of nodes here. And so when you run this system, you could see it's going kind of fast here. Let me slow it down a little. Um, right now, it's registering that it's in. This tile coupling is activated, right? This tile sensor is activated, and it activates that node. And so this is kind of a map of where it is in this 2D environment. Um, and this is kind of what Hippocampus does with place cells. And so it models that. 
and you could edit these tile sensors um, directly in here. Um, so you see all these tile sensors, and I think we put in something to automatically create, like yeah, a tile set, a set of these. Um, but you could see that you know we could take some of these out, for example, and now um, they're not all there, and so it you know it'll only respond when it's in um, those uh, parts of the world. Um, so there you have it. That's the basics of uh, Odor World and some of the different kinds of sensors and effectors you can create. Um, in another video, I'm going to show you how sort of the theory behind these pursuer avoider networks, for example, this one. Um, they're fairly simple, but there's a lot of interesting things with them. Wow, this is a fast computer. I think I created this simulation on a slower computer, and so it didn't quite zip around like this.